Good evening. If you'd like, you go ahead and open up your Bibles. We're in 1 Samuel 13. We'll be covering 13 and 14 tonight. So where we left off in chapter 12, are we on a good note or on a bad note? We're on a good note, right? And Samuel's, but there are stipulations to that good note, right? If you obey God and you follow him, you and your king, because Samuel's talking to the people as well, then things will go well for you. But if not, he will, he'll get rid of you just like he did your father. And uh, so we need to keep that in mind. All right. So we'll and, mind if I say and, but, and also remember, we have a king now, right? We have Saul. And Saul specifically, so far, has been on the good path, right? And that's important because some things are going to happen tonight. But yeah. All right, so we'll pick up in chapter 13 here. It says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet, throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now Israel heard it, and said that Saul had attacked a garrison of Philistines, that the Israel that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were gathered together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight Israel, thirty thousand chariots, six thousand horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits, and some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So here, when it talks about the Saul's, I guess you'd say smaller army, the people that would stay with him all the time, I think that number comes from that 330,000 that we talked previous. He took about 3,000 out of that. Jonathan has 1,000 men, and then he has 2,000, which it seems like those might be split into two different areas. It mentions two different areas here in the text. Um, so we have that. So I, I, I find it interesting here, though, that Jonathan, it says Jonathan attacks the garrison. And then we have Saul kind of telling everybody, hey, pretty much get ready. We're going to war because because of this attack and i don't know if that's why israel credited saul with that attack because he's kind of warning everybody hey this has happened get ready we're going to war um but like i said i don't really know why they are, they credit saul with that there um and then also in in verse five there instead of um thirty thousand some texts read three thousand which seems to line up a little bit more with the rest of those numbers there. Um, but, you know, how are the children of Israel, how are they reacting to all this? Well, they're scared. Yeah. And the reason being is, is, if you look back in history, the Philistines was not totally giants like the one David fought, but all of them were huge men, and they were all warriors taking a lot of the land in that whole area. That's the reason when the Israelites, when they went and scouted it out, they said, there's giants in the land. Oh, we can't go against them. And they're also their oppressors right now. So that's who they've been dealing with. For, I don't know how long exactly, but that's, that is the threat. The opposition right now is going to be the Philistines. And, and we'll see. Uh, later on in the text that the Philistines have access to weapons that Israelites don't. And even some of it we can see here, right? So we're talking about, you said 30,000 or 3,000. Either way, it's 30,000 or 3,000 chariots, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's a pretty big technological advantage over the Israelites. They don't have things like that. Uh, so them scattering is not surprising. It's like the Egyptians when they was chasing them across the Red Sea. Mm hmm yeah, they had the same, they had that advantage as well. Uh, any thoughts through, through verse 8 there? I, I might say this. So it seems that at first, 
the Israelites are successful, right? It seems like they're successful. Jonathan's gaining victory. Philistines kind of regroup. They get, you know, like we're talking about these chariots uh, and, and horsemen. Um, and they go after the Israelites. Why is it that the Israelites are not successful the second time? What do you think? Maybe. I, I think it, it, it may be sin, but I think it may just be their confidence has failed them. And they're like, well, we don't think we can do this anymore. And, well, if you don't think you can do it, then you, you won't be able to, right? Uh, and so I think that may be, it may be as simple as that. Maybe there are other things. Maybe it's sin. Um, maybe God's trying to test them in this to see what they're going to do. I don't know. But it may just be that their faith is failing them. And so when your faith fails you, then you're going to fail. <laughs> Well, you know it's going to fail at some point because they're not, they don't have a king by God's instruction. Yeah. And what I love about the, the whole king situation is that the king thing could work out, right? I mean, God has said, like, this can work out. If your king is keeping in line with my laws and my statutes and you both, like, you and the king both obey me, this can work out. But it's not what he wanted originally, Right. But he, he's allowed it to be, and it, it can still work out. It's just depending upon them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. Anything else? If not, you want to take Sure. All right, so I'm going to read 8 through 12. I think that kind of gets us our next big point there. So it says, He waited seven days. So it's about Saul. Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and then people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me, and you did not come within the days appointed that the Philistines had mustered and that the Philistines had mustered at Mishmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. All right, so you have, as you have Saul, he's already at Gilgal. He's waiting for Samuel, which just had been, you know, determined ahead of time. He's going to wait seven days. He waits the seven days. Is that a good thing? Yes. But when he waits the seven days, he starts to panic. What, what do the people start doing? They start leaving, right? And what we see Saul do is we see Saul take on some responsibilities, if you want to say that, are not not in his uh, not, un, not in his authority. Maybe you want to say right. He's taking on responsibilities that are Samuel's responsibilities. Uh, now, is it a bad thing to entreat the Lord? Yes, because I mean, when he went against him, it was the same thing in his sons when they decided, oh, we need to burn some incense. It wasn't what was commanded, and they weren't supposed to. Same was it. It's a wonder God just didn't strike him deep. Yeah. So it's not bad to seek the Lord in general, right? Uh, but it is bad to seek the Lord when he's he or someone who he's giving revelation to has told you a way to do something. And they said, wait for me. you got to wait, right? And so in general, it's not bad to say, I want the Lord on my side. That's very good, right? But you've got to do it the way God set up. We see Saul not doing that here. Uh, when Samuel gets it, which I love this picture, right? So it's like Saul has just finished offering the sacrifices, and it's like, oh, now Samuel shows up, right? It's like, what great timing. Uh, but when Samuel shows up, um, he says, what are you doing? Uh, what does Saul say? What, what are some of the things he says there? What were some of the things that Saul says there? Yeah. Yeah, I had to make myself do it, right? It's like, well, did he have to make himself do it? No, like he did it. He chose to do it. He didn't. I mean, maybe he didn't feel great about it, but he he had a choice in this and he decided to do what he did. Also, I do like here how he I think, you know, is pretty honest as far as why he did what he did. And he even says, like, when I saw the people were scattering from me, I think this tells us something about Saul. Right. Who does Saul care about? Maybe whose opinion does Saul care about? The people's opinion, right? Now, he had instruction for Samuel, and he knows who Samuel represents, right? He represents the Lord. But whose opinion does he care about in the moment? The people's. Now, 
Yes. Because he's scared that if they run off, he ain't going to have a king of no people. That's exactly right. what he can do for the people. It's what he can do to keep the people where he can stay king. I think that's right. I think Saul thought the power was in the people. And that's the problem, right? Because the power was never in the people. The power was in God. So what he's doing is he's acting in a way where it's like, I'm trying to please the people because the power is with the people. That's not the case, right? You need to please God. You need to obey God because the power is with him. And that's what Saul wasn't seeing. Uh, and we'll see how that works out in a minute. Do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I think all three of his excuses that he gives were <laughs> things testing his faith. Are you, does he trust God or does he trust his own ability to do something? And, you know, Samuel said he'd be there in seven days or whatever. and He, he is there. He's just not there when thought, Saul thought he would be there. And then the, the people scattering, like you said, it doesn't matter how many are with him as long as God's with him. And then the Philistines, you know, he was afraid they were going to come down and attack him. And mm -hmm. so those three things are, they're legitimate fears. Um, but like you said, he had instruction from Samuel on what he should be doing. Yeah. And they're especially legitimate. You know, when he was probably used to, to this type of thing because what we know about what type of person he was, uh, he was the type of person that was attractive to people. You know, he was the type of person that people would look for physically mm -hmm. in a king. So he was probably used to meeting those types of demands. And that, you know, yeah. maybe why he like the people's perception was something he was used to, like, you know, looking at him favorably. So this is different. You know, this reminds me of Moses going up into the mountain and the air. Mm -hmm. He didn't come back down. They thought he would, and the air just went get back into the that's, that's a good point. And so, and Aaron kind of makes the same excuse, right? It's like, well, I kind of had to do this, right? Uh, and of course, Aaron didn't have to do it, but he uses that as an excuse. He uses the people, people's pressure as an excuse. To disobey God. It's a good point. Well, I, well, I was thinking, you know, this is a this is a pressure situation, mm -hmm. and people tend to react differently under pressure. Yeah. And I don't know that Saul's ever had this kind of pressure on him at this point in time. And now, you know, he has a situation where people, you know, are walking away from him. They're starting to scatter, and he's feeling that pressure. I gotta do something. I gotta make something happen. Mm -hmm. I gotta, you know, kind of rally it back up. So, you know, I, I don't know if that pressure compelled you know, him to take matters into his own hands. Yeah. I think it, yeah, I think it probably did, right? Played a part, big part. All right. So let's look at Samuel's reaction. Okay. So we'll pick up in 13. Mm. 12, 13. Yep. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have kept the commandment. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then Samuel rose and went up to Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. So we see Samuel rebukes him. And Samuel pretty much tells him, like, God would have established a dynasty through you if you would have just been faithful. And how we see Jonathan going to be in chapter 14, he seems like he would have been a very good king. And maybe not. You know, Saul started out really well. And maybe Jonathan would have had that tendency too. But because of Saul's sin, Jonathan wasn't even going to have a shot at him. And which they told him that beforehand. You know, if you're not going to obey, you're not going to be, you're not going to keep this position. Um, and you're not, God's going to do away with you. And so that's what he's doing here. Um, so it, it looks pretty bleak. You know, he's telling him that you're not, your lineage is not going to stay on the throne. And he's got about 600 men with him uh, and we talked at the beginning that he had about 3,000 roughly and so all those men have fled and he's just got the 600 men with him and then Samuel's leaving 
as well. So Samuel's not staying with him. He's going back. Um, and so it doesn't look very good at this point in time. Um, with uh, being displeased with God and being displeased with Samuel and pretty much saying there's, there's not hope for, for your family as far as rule. Well, one thing that we'll see later on about Jonathan, uh, even though he was Saul's son, Jonathan actually proves that he's real loyal to David and to God in a lot of events before he's actually killed with his father. But I mean, I think if he was more tendency to be wicked, like go a lot against God, I don't think he would have done all that stuff that he did for David. And even when he went against the Philistines, he actually seek God at that time what to do. That's true. Yeah, so one thing I, I think I want to talk about here is maybe two things, and I'm, I'll try to make it quick. One is when he talks about he would have established his kingdom forever. Um, I, I think there the idea is that it would, have, it would have continued as long as his family was probably loyal to God, right? Um, I think we see maybe sometimes similar language used with other kings and their lines will fall whenever you have wicked kings come into place um, as far as earthly kingdoms, right? And um, so maybe here there's a hint of not just earthly kingdom possibly, right? Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to David. We're not going to get into that much too, too much right now. But the second thing I want to say is, and someone feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on this. So... What I'm thinking here, so back in verse 1, says Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he reigned for two years over Israel, and then we get into the story, right? So it seems to me that we're, it, I guess it depends on how you're talking about the beginning of his reign. But let's say two or three years into Saul's reign. Do we think that's probably about right? Does that seem right to us? Okay. Saul reigns for 40 years. So we're really early on, right? I mean, you're like, we're still at the beginning of his reign. Now, he doesn't know that. But here's the point I want to make. It says, verse 14, but now your kingdom will not continue. So when he sins here and God pronounces his judgment through Samuel and says, your kingdom won't continue, does it end right this second? No, right? So we're talking about things reminding us of certain things. So I think about with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? So Adam and Eve in the garden says, you will surely die. It's like, well, what does that mean? They died that day? Well, maybe in a sense, but, and so like here, in a sense, Saul's kingdom has ended that day, right? It's not going to continue. It's, it's a done deal now. Um, but also saying that God has, you know, uh, declared something doesn't mean it's happening that moment, but it will happen, right? Uh, so just maybe that's useful for us to think about. Sometimes we think certain phrases or certain proclamations mean it has to happen immediately, but God doesn't always work in our time. Well, see, when you mentioned that of me, when they said that they were going to die, they didn't physically die, but they actually died a spiritual death when they were took out of paradise. Right. Because that's when all the plagues began prior to that, they didn't have So that happened to me. And then on um, Saul, when uh, Samuel told him that the Lord, that he was going to get to live and be king, but because you transgressed, your kingdom was going to be cut off. Saul, actually his kingdom was took away from him. Even though he had the title of king, God kind of removed him being loyal to, said, if you'll be my people, I'll be your God. And he actually told Saul to go to find in the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin. And David actually was a pre-king that God blessed, even though Saul was kind of king, but God found favor in David instead of Saul. So he did do it immediately, even though he carried the title king, he didn't have God behind him. Yeah, that's right. That's true. That played on Saul's conscience, too. Like, every time they'd go out to battle, okay, is this going to be it? Is this 
You think it would. Maybe it didn't as much as we would hope. <laughs> but I'm sure there was something in the back of his mind probably from then on. But, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think even in my own mind, Saul gets a bad rap. Like, God chose him because he knew he wouldn't carry it out. But in all reality, Saul could have been a great king if he had just chose to be. And where it talks about him establishing that dynasty forever, it's possible that if he would have followed God, that through him, Christ would have come. A possibility. I'm not saying, but I mean, it's possible. So, and That was going to be a question I was going to ask real quick. And it might, I guess I should know the answer to it, but has it been prophesied yet that the Messiah was going to come through Judah up into this point? Or is that something we find out later? So I think, say what? So, yeah, so you're talking about the blessings um, that uh, Jacob gives for his sons, right? So I don't know if at this point they would have interpreted it that way. But I think looking back, we would say that that would be uh, one of the prophecies that would have declared that. But I don't know if they would have thought about that this time. But my point is that, so prophecy is not choosing your fate. It's just telling you what you will choose, if that makes sense. And so if, but Saul could have chose to be faithful, and maybe that prophecy would have read different. And that's just my understanding of prophecy. It's not that, well, this has to happen this way because God wants it to happen that way. It's because we chose that way is the reason that it's going to happen that way and that aligns with God's will. He knew how everything would play out. Right. He could float these prophecies in a long way and just give it to us. Right. Yeah. We're going to have to pick up the pace. I, I think what you said about you choose, it's just like even if somebody goes up and gets repentance and actually is baptized and becomes a Christian, as long as they choose to do right by their deeds, and follow Christ, they'll stay on the path of righteousness. But if along the way they say, hmm, I'll try this, and it's evil, it's the choice that they made the same way as Saul made the choice to offer that he wasn't supposed to. So anytime God sees that if you stay the path, you'll make it, but he don't fix it to where you're going to fail just because he knows the future, because he can see both directions, even though it ain't happened yet. Right. And our choices and our deeds determines the outcome of when we actually stop living here, where we're going to be at. Right. So I'll go ahead and sum up the, the end of the chapter here. Um, so really, they, they only have two swords in the camp, Saul and Jonathan. They don't even have a blacksmith in the land of Israel. They have to go to the Philistines to sharpen any farming tools or whatever. And I don't understand the, the process there, but I'm sure that they charge a way lot more for an Israelite getting a plow sharpened than they would another Philistine. And so it's hurting them economically and militarily, militarily as well. And so that's something to keep in mind um, when they're, they're scattering everything. Of course, they should have had their faith in the Lord, but they don't. And so we'll continue on from there if you want to pick yep. up. In All right. I'm probably going to read a pretty large section of this, like down to 15, which actually in the whole chapter is not that large section. But that's what I'm going to read to, okay? So here we go. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priests of the Lord in Shiloh, were in Ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Bozes, the name of the other, Senna. The one crag rose on the north front, uh, on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. 
Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Let us go to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up to them. But they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand. And this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and the armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a fur furrow's length and an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. All right, so what you have here is you have Jonathan, which we've been talking about Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, taking his armor bearer and saying, let's go do something, right? Let's go do something. And so... What what's you know the gist of their plan? Depending on the answer that when they go up, on whether they go not going to go, or that if they say come up, that means that the Lord has given them to them to win it. But if they say not come up, they go. Yeah, it doesn't seem. This is my opinion. It doesn't seem like a great military strategy, right? Just like let's show ourselves to the enemy and see what happens, right? They outnumber us, and you know all this kind of. It's like let's see what happens. Uh, so they do. I, I get the sense that either way they're going to fight. It's just in one way they can be like, all right, let's go because God is on our side. Definitely, we have a sign. Maybe the other way it looks like to me, they'd still be fighting. It's just that they wouldn't have the the same confidence. It may be. But what do we see? Is God on their side? Yes. And how does that work out when God's on your side? Works out very, very good, right? So I think what we see here with Jonathan, and again, I'm trying to make the points as concise as we can because we still have quite a bit to cover in 15 minutes. But I think what we see is we see some of Jonathan's character here, right? Is Jonathan afraid to put himself in danger for God or God's people? No. Is Jonathan afraid to put his life in the hands of the, of the Lord? No. Right. In fact, he wants to. That's, that's what he's seeking to do. here. like, look, it may be that God's with us and he's trusting in God. We see he has faith in God. We see he has courage for God. Um, these are qualities that are good to remember. We talked about already a second ago, which we've not been introduced to David yet. But we talked about his friendship with David. These are probably characteristics that we want to remember when we're thinking about why was David friends with Jonathan, Saul's son? These are probably good characteristics to remember. Right. Because he was courageous for the Lord, he had faith in God, and he was a he was a man of action, right? He was wanting to do something for the Lord. Um, I think that's good for us to see. Uh, it gives us, like I said, insight into who Jonathan is. And I, like I said, I love the uh, the phrase. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Uh, just the confidence he has in the Lord there. Um, again is reminiscent of people you see who are, we, we would say are heroes of the faith. Uh, Jonathan, maybe sometimes we don't think about in that list, but I, I think he is. Um, anything you want to say? I don't think so. All right. Yeah. Right. That's right. And we see that often with uh, men of faith, right? Many times men of faith will have people who are willing to follow them and uh, have their faith in the men of faith, right? And they follow their leadership. So we see that here with Jonathan as well. Not that it happens every time, but I'm just saying uh, it happens sometimes. Like Jeremiah. Not much for Jeremiah. Um, I probably should sum up the next section. Yeah, that's fine. Saul, huh? um, so Saul hears this going on. Uh, him and the high priest and... They say, you know, uh, what is this going on? And so they're like, well, let's go. Let's seize this opportunity here because they see people 
fleeing and melting away, I think the text says. And so um, it, Saul tells the priest to withdraw his hand. And it's almost, from what I understand, the priest would bless them before they would go out to war. And Saul's like, ah, none of that. Let's go. we got to get it now. Or it's almost even like the priest is like, hold on, hold on, let, let's figure out what we're going to do. Right. And so I was like, I'm not waiting anymore. Right. And so again, he's kind of showing that impatient side of him, mm -hmm. uh, that he didn't want to wait on whatever uh, the priest or the Lord had to say about it. Um, and let's see. That may not be the priest's blessing, but he wanted to make sure the ark right. was with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the days of the judges, you know, they were they were doing the same thing. They said, if we've got, oh, we have a judge, so we're good. And now we can do whatever we want. And now if they have a king, it seems like those things are creeping back up. And we have a king, he'll fight our battles. We don't have to be obedient to God. And Saul, in Saul's mind, make sure you bring the ark. That way we know we'll be victorious. That's very good. Um, I can take the next part. Like, uh, so what you have is that Saul goes... And what you see is a lot of people rally to him, right? So you have the 600 that have been there with him. That They go. Uh, you have the ones that have fled, the ones that ran away, went into the caves and holes. They come out, and they're, they're starting to fight. But what you also have, which I think is kind of funny, is you have Hebrews that have joined the Philistines, and they're like, we're going to turn on the Philistines now. And so they join Saul, and they start fighting against the Philistines as well. And another thing we see is that we see that the Philistines are very confused about what's happening. They're fighting each other. And so what we see is a victory for Israel. Now, who is the victory? Let's see. I, I'll try to point out the, the verse. Verse 23. Who is the victory ascribed to? The Lord. The Lord saved Israel that day. Uh, I, I think that's important, right? So was it Saul? Wasn't Saul. Was it even Jonathan? No, Jonathan may have been like the catalyst, right? But he's not the one that saved the day. Right, the Lord saved the day uh, because Jonathan had faith, um, and so the Lord is able to deliver. Yes. So I think everything we're reading here. So you're talking about from chapter thirteen. Yes. So I think everything from chapter thirteen to chapter fourteen is all one story. I, so, and maybe I'm wrong about this. It does. You're talking about with Jonathan, right? Yeah. I, I wonder if these aren't two different inc incidents. So, like, Jonathan's victorious before, and then this is a different uh, time where he's... It could, be this, it could be that before was a summarization, and now we're getting the full story. Uh, I don't know. When I read it, it made it sound like two different things to me. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it lays it out different than I think, though. Yeah, I'm not saying my way is better. I'm just saying. <laughs> Sometimes we don't understand, but if you read to get into the study of it, you need to know the other part, even if some of it happens later, to kind of give you, when you do read the latter part, oh, I know what this is. I've done been told it before. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Hmm. I think we can sum up most of this. All right, so here we'll have to, I guess, or else Larson won't be happy with me when he gets back. All right, so um, Saul makes a vow. Uh, he, I think he kind of gets caught up in what's going on here. And what's the vow that Saul makes? Can't eat. Yeah, can't eat uh, until the basically. The Philistines are destroyed, right? Victory is assured, okay? Which, by the way, the Lord's on their side. Victory is already assured, but maybe Saul doesn't realize that, right? So, but that's the, that's the vow he makes. What happens if they do? They'll be put to death, right? That's pretty harsh for this. Now, how does this work out? Does this, this work out well for the Israelites that Saul makes this vow? Well, I think because that he told them if they did, they died, he actually sentenced his sin. God yeah. used his own words. Oh yeah, I think that's true. But does that work out well for the Israelite soldiers, let's say? No, because what happens? Yeah, I mean, like, they're they're doing 
you know, some pretty vigorous stuff and they get weak uh, and they're not able to keep going. Um, now, it's important that we re remember the beginning of chapter 14. So the beginning of chapter 14, we're talking about the Jonathan and armor bearer situation. Who knew what they were doing? No one. Did Saul know what they were doing? No. Which also means that Jonathan and the armor bearer don't know what's happening back you know, at, at base camp whenever Saul makes this vow. So Jonathan, he's tired as well, right? He's, he's just gone and killed 20 Philistines. I don't know, maybe more at this point, but at least 20. And he sees some honey. Well, all the men see the honey, right? But Jonathan sees the honey. And what does he do? He eats it, right? And when he eats it, what happens? That's right. His, it says, at least mine says his eyes become bright, right? So, yeah, his countenance brightens. Yeah, he, yeah, he gets energy back. That's right. Um, and then what do the other soldiers say? That's right. Which, I, I don't know, again, what to make of this, but it's like, well, how slowly or how quickly did Jonathan get this honey, right? Was he, did he just, like, go grab it real quick? Because I would think if I'm a soldier, I, I mean, it wouldn't be hard to figure out if Jonathan's bringing the staff to his face, like, I'm going to eat this honey. It's like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. They just let him do it. But either way, so he hears of this, and hears about what his father has declared, the, the oath, the vow his father has made. And what does he think about that? That's right. Or it, 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 and you're right. So the result at least won't be as good as it would have been, right? Because of the, the rash vow. And what you see is you see Jonathan, he, he seems here in this situation has more wisdom than his father does, right? He's able to look at this and say, that's not great. Now, again, I don't know all the reasons that Saul made this vow. It could be, again, that he's just caught at the moment. It's like, let's go right now. Let's not let anything keep us from just pursuing these people and trying to wipe them out. That could be what it is. And, and again, that would be an emotional decision. It doesn't seem to work out well. And Jonathan's able to see that. Um, again, I think that maybe speaks to Jonathan's character here. He's got more wisdom, it seems, than his father does. Um, and I'm not trying to badmouth Saul at this point, but I'm just saying, I think we see that about Jonathan there. But if you look in the past, when Joshua and all the Israelites went into the land and they were not sinning, and there wasn't sin in the camp, God was with them. They had strength. Sometimes God killed the people and the Israelites didn't even raise a sword. I mean, it was either by hornets or the angels. Killed like 20 or 30,000 of them at one time outside of the city's attack. So if God's with you, it don't really matter about eating. I mean, he'll actually supply the energy just like he did the clothes. They never did wear out from the time they left Egypt to the guys over there where under a normal case, your clothes would have wore out and then he fed them along the way. Yeah. And it seems that here not only as um, you know, Saul made this crazy thing, but then after the people can eat, they're even eating the blood with the meat, causing them to sin. Yeah. So once they have, they know they have victory, they go crazy. Right. Right. And so they're eating the blood, and then somebody says, "Well, they're eating the blood," and Saul says, "No, don't do that." And he brings a rock in, and they, so they start killing them where the blood's draining when they're eating it. And then Saul builds an altar, and it says it's the first altar that he built, which in it references that he's going to build more. And so he's, he's starting to decline, and it seems like he's not trying to turn back. It just seems like he's going a little deeper and a little deeper. And just instead of inquiring the Lord, well, he can't inquire from Samuel, who probably actually would give him the advice that he needs. He's got um, Ahijah, and so his he's in the same boat as Saul is. He's, his family's not going to continue as high priest, just as Saul's not going to continue as king. And so it's not a very good situation here that we have. And Saul has created some of that situation here by this rash vow that he's made. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to point out that Saul, whenever he's, I guess you'd say, rebuking the people, um, 
he does mention, so this is going to be, I guess, like halfway through verse 34. He talks about them bringing uh, the ox or the sheep, and they are going to slaughter them and eat them here. He does, to his credit, say, and do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood, right? I do want to point this out, um, and I'm probably going to point it out again here in a little bit if we have time. Um, but with Saul's vow, if someone disobeyed Saul's vow or commandment or whatever, what was the penalty? Yes. Death. Now here, who are the people sinning against? God. And how does Saul does he put them to death? Nope. No. I just want to point that out. I think Saul feels more strongly about his own rules than God's rules. I think this is an example where we can see that. All right. We, uh, you want to zoom as much as I can? Yeah. Um, probably just sum it up because we really don't have time to talk about it if we don't. I'm trying to sum it up, Alan. I'm not good at it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take this last section before. We'll, we'll sum up 247. So Saul wants to go down. And, and plunder the Philistines, and the people says, do whatever seems good to you, which is pretty much what he's doing anyway at this point, right? And so um, he tries to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord doesn't answer him, so he assumes that there's sin in the camp. And they cast lots between Saul's family and the people, and it falls on Saul's family, and then it falls to Jonathan. And he says, Jonathan, what'd you do? And he said, I didn't know about your oath, or your, yeah, I didn't know about your oath, and I, I took some of the honey, but Jonathan accepts his fate that his father has declared on him. He says, which I think in speaks to Jonathan's character. Right. And so he says, you know, if you have to kill me, kill me. Well, then the people speak up and they say, no, you're not going to kill Jonathan. Our victory and everything that's happened today, the Lord was working with Jonathan is the reason that today's happened the way that it has. And so I think that the reason that when they cast lots, it falls to Jonathan. I think, at least in my mind, that the Lord is trying to show Saul how ridiculous this vow or this oath is. And he's wanting him to change his mind. And it, the people has to come in and intercede before Saul changes his mind. And I think Brother Don made a very good point in our men's Bible study this past week. He said, if you see that you're going down the wrong road, turn back. Go a different way. But Saul's not doing that here. He's being so stubborn that he's going to kill his own child over this vow. And I guess in his mind, he said, no, I made this oath and I'm going to keep it. And it doesn't matter how silly or irrational it is. That's what I'm going to do because that's what I said I'm going to do. But it's the wrong thing. And the people see that here. And so now you have Saul that's going to be removed from king. You don't. Samuel's not here at this point in time. And then the people are not even obeying him at this point in time. They're saying, no, we're not following that command. or That's not happening today. And so it doesn't look very good in this, this account here. Um, and so, you know, if he would, I don't know how much time he got to spend with Jonathan, but if he would spend more time with Jonathan and be more like him, he would be more pleasing to God. And um, we see that throughout. Go ahead. It, oh, I was just going to say, I can take the last section there. Okay, that sounds good. We don't have very do you much think, time. Okay, I'll do that then. All right, so that kind of wraps up the story, like the specific story of this battle here. Uh, what we have at the end of chapter 14 is kind of, I guess, a summary of how battles in general went for, went for Saul, right? So what you have is you have Saul, he's fighting everyone around him, and what does it say? Was he successful or not? Yes, he's successful, right? So even though he's been disobedient to God, uh, we see that God is still giving him success. And I think it's because what he's doing here is he is finishing the job that the Israelites were supposed to finish whenever during the conquest, right? That they did not finish. So I think God is giving him success in that, you know, for the most part because of that. I also want to point this out because I think it's worth thinking about because this is fulfilling a promise that God made, a prophecy God made. So look at verse 52. It says, and there was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. That's not that part, but the next part is. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he attached him to himself. Do you remember what, what one of the prophecies was about the kings? That's right. He would take your sons and he would use them for his army, right? And what we see here is that's what Saul's doing, right? So he's already fulfilling some of these prof uh, prophecies. Also, 
<clears throat> this is going to be, I think, how we're going to see the relationship between Saul and David. And it's worth mentioning, this is you know a, a pattern he's already established. So when we see what happens with David later on, it shouldn't be as surprising as maybe it comes across, because Saul's already trying to attach any strong man to himself that he can. And it doesn't say anything about, in that little summary, it doesn't say anything about his faithfulness to God or anything. He says he was a fierce warrior. And that's pretty much going to sum up Saul. He was a fierce warrior, but as far as obeying the Lord and doing things that he should, he doesn't do that. Uh, so next time we're going to be looking at chapter 15 and 16. So make sure you read that in preparation. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.